<clears throat> All right, got that uh, got that Copenhagen right where I wanted it. Um, what's happening, guys? It's been a long time since I've done a podcast. I've been very busy with work, um, guiding through July, August has been pretty busy, which has been awesome. That's exactly what we want. Um, as a guide, you got to work as much as you can when you can. And this is, this is the time to do it. So I apologize to everybody. I know I'm a shitty person for not putting out more podcasts. Um, but, uh, I'm trying my best here guys. So as we're coming up on it, we're going to talk a little bit about fall fishing today. Um, kind of fall fishing techniques, what to look for, um, what I like to do, and just the way I approach fall. Um, In Colorado here and in Gunnison Valley, uh, we have very low water. So it's interesting this time of year. Normally, we'd be floating through the month of September, I'd say. This upcoming Friday, they're going to be dropping the Taylor River to 150, I believe. So that'll drop the gunness in a fair amount. We are still going to try and float. We are still going to be fishing. So we're going to talk about how to uh, how to go about that and the techniques I like to use, like I said, and uh, we'll get into it here. All right, so September's here. Um, September's here Saturday. So we are we're rocking and rolling with the fall. Colors are going to start to change. Um, water temps are dropping. Air temps are dropping. So those fish are going to start getting on the feed a little bit. Um, a little bit more here with the climate change. Um, they need to eat. They need to feed before uh, winter kicks in. And so um, there's a couple different things I want to talk about today. Um, and I'm going to go over quite a bit here. I got a bunch of little little footnotes written down. But um, I, I definitely am going to go into nymphing. We're going to jump into that kind of right off the bat. Nymphing is going to be... Um, some of the best bet for fall fishing. Um, I know here in Gunnison, we have some kokanee salmon. Um, so we're going to be talking about nymphing for kokanee, how to catch kokanee salmon. And we're also going to be talking about nymphing for the trout, uh, how we're going to catch the trout as well, throwing nymph rigs, even in the low water and even in the clear water. Um, I also want to talk about some dry flies, um, you know, what kind of tactics we're going to be using there with tippet, all the tackle we're going to need. Um, obviously hooks, flies, stuff like that. So let's go ahead and, um, I'm going to start focusing on nymphing here a little bit and, you know, nymphing definitely takes a lot of skill to, uh, get the hang of it. A lot of people throw, go, Oh, you can just throw a bobber and, you know, an indicator on and some flies and you're ready to rock. It's not quite that easy. There is a lot to it. Um, so in the fall, obviously, like I've already brought up a little bit we got low clear water in the fall most rivers around the mid or sorry around the west are going to have low water coming up into September October as well so how do we get after those fish in that low clear water especially nymphing with an indicator um the way I like to do it is I like to focus on mid-river drifts a lot you see those fish start to push off of the banks just a little bit and start to focus more on that mid river and you end up especially in low water you end up rowing over at least in a boat you end up rowing over a lot of fish you see a lot of fish come out from mid river right under the boat if you're walk waiting it's a little bit easier to fish that mid river and get into those sections so definitely focus on those mid river drifts and deep runs and shelves look for those big deep runs and big drop offs those fish are going to be hanging out on those drop-offs, not only in fall, um, also, you know, summer, spring, they're still hanging out in those drop-offs. So that's kind of a given to fish those deep runs, the big shelves. Um, and out of a boat, obviously I fish out of a boat quite a bit, but we're going to be focusing on more in front of the boat with a little bit shorter leader. And that kind of helps the better feel of those takes. And you can kind of correct your indicator just a little bit to be able to see those stakes. If we get a long leader with a lot of weight, it's going to be hard to, for those flies to sit in the zone where we need them, where we can actually see that indicator move. So I like to go with a little bit shorter leader, definitely fair amount of weight on there. 
Um, but I do like that shorter leader and occasionally I'll even jump over to a 90 degree rig, which basically you, you can either build your own leader, or even tie onto your indicator. Sometimes if you tie onto that indicator, if you set the hook a little bit too hard, like I do, you can break that indicator off and that's not fun either. Um, but you can build that leader, you know, with a butt section and then you can kind of taper off from there. If I'm fishing for trout and that low water, I'm usually tapering down from that butt section. I like to tie maybe a three foot butt section on a leader or something like that. And then I can put my indicator on there and then I'll kind of taper down two X, three X, four X. And I like to go almost down four X, five X most of the time, depending on where I'm fishing. Um, but that 90 degree rig or kind of what I'm talking about definitely gets down a little bit. And I talk about that rig a little bit in my winter nymph fishing episode as well. So focus on that, on that nice short leader for the most part, being able to feel that indicator with, with a fair amount of weight as well. And just be warned, you are going to be bouncing bottom. You are going to be hitting bottom. Um, when I go to tip it, I usually use, I've been fishing a lot more fluoro and I would suggest fluoro during this low clear water because it's a little bit more abrasive. Um, you will be bouncing on bottom. So you're going to want something that will hold up and the fish aren't going to see. So definitely point more towards that fluoro. If you are targeting bigger fish or know that there are going to be bigger fish in the area, especially on bigger rivers, not so much tailwaters, but bigger freestone rivers, you definitely can go up to that 3x, 4x, you know, 3x to your first bug, 4x to your second bug. Still stick with fluoro just to be safe, you know, that so those fish aren't going to see it as well. And like I said, it's a little bit stronger, more abrasive. It'll hold up when you are bouncing on bottom. Um, you know, and then going to the indicator a little bit, I, I do stick with the thingamabobber. Um, this might sound a little insane, but I do think indicator color can play a role in that low water. Um, I have seen a lot of people throw clear and black. I don't use the black. I can't see them worth a damn. So um, the clear is a good bet, but kind of hear me out on this. You know, this, like I said, this might sound a little bit crazy here, but, um, you know, with the fall kind of brings a little bit more wind, leaves start to change colors, fall in the river a little bit. Um, I like to camouflage my indicator. It makes sense to me. Um, so I tend, to, I tend to stay away from pink, red, and I lean a little bit more towards that yellow orange and then also white, you know, white's a great indicator for fall and low water, clear water, even tail waters. White's a great indicator for that just because it blends in just a little bit more. And I know that sounds a little bit crazy. Oh, you're camouflaging your indicator to look like leaves. Nah, kind of, but the fish are a little bit more used to seeing that color, I would say. Um, they've seen pink and red all summer long. So, um, I, I tend to lean towards more of that, that yellow orange indicator color. And like I said, white is also an awesome color. Um, but that white can be a little bit tough to see in that fall glare, you know, where that sun's changed just a little bit and it's tough to see. Uh, so, you know, think about that just a tad, especially if you're in a boat or if you're fishing, you know, maybe some shaded areas or early morning or close to dusk. Think about that white indicator just a little bit more because it is hard to see. Um, like I said, black, people do fish black. Um, I can't. But I also like clear a lot. Clear is a great indicator color. Um, bug wise, you know, I would, I would tend to kind of go towards the hatches a little bit. Obviously there's going to be midges in the water. There'll be, you know, some betas in the water. And then as you get later in the fall, you know, eggs are, you know, egg patterns are, are good bet. Um, but I, I've talked about it before I kind of stick towards those naturals, you know, the pheasant tails, the RS2s, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, and those, those small betas, you know, bars emergers, stuff like that. But a lot of natural colors. Um, they've been working well. That that worm can work well in the early morning around here. And then I, I tend to change up and go towards those midges or betas. So while we're on the subject of nymphing, um, we're going to talk about the kokanee salmon. Um, and in some areas of Colorado, we're pretty fortunate enough to have kokanee salmon 
which is basically a lock, landlocked sockeye salmon. And they're a lot of fun to hook on a fly rod. I talk a lot about the salmon in, I'm trying to think of what episode it is. It might be six or seven um, with Dan Brow, who's a biologist here up in the Gunnison County. And he talks about the kokanee salmon and the release and why the salmon are here. So if you're interested, you can go back and, and check that out and learn a little bit more about the kokanee salmon and, you know, their role that they play. But we do have those salmon that start to move up river in the fall. We've been seeing some pods here in Gunnison moving up. Nothing huge yet. It'll be interesting to see what this low water brings for the salmon and kind of the amount we see. Last year, I believe, was a record number of salmon that we had come up and that they actually spawned um, at the hatchery on on the East River up there past Almont. But um so we're going to talk about how to kind of nymph for those salmon a little bit. And it is a, definitely a different technique. It is a lot harder than most people think. Um, I've, I've definitely struggled with it over the years, but I, I've figured it out just a tad. I'm no expert by any means, but I have figured them out just a little bit and can be productive, especially with clients in the boat. So nymphing will be kind of the best technique there. I have heard of people swinging streamers and certain wet flies and having some decent luck there. And I, I do run into people who are walk wading and fishing for salmon that they think they're eating dry flies. Oh, they you know, these kokanee, they're crushing dry flies. They're coming. I can't figure out what they're eating. They're not hitting dry flies. Um, I've never heard of it. Maybe people have caught them on dries. Um, don't take my word for it that they won't eat a dry fly, but those salmon will come up and breach a little bit. They're very active, and so they'll come up and they'll almost look like they're rising, but they'll just kind of come up, splash. Um, I'm not sure if they're just grabbing air. I'm not sure what they're doing, um, but I can almost guarantee they're, you're not going to catch them on a dry fly. Like I said, can't quote me on that. Maybe you can catch them on a dry fly, something I don't know. If you can catch them on a dry fly, contact me. I'd like to know how you do that. Um, but nymphing will be the best technique. And it's going to be a very deep, heavy nymph rig. That's going to be key here. So you're going to want a large indicator that uh, that you can see. You know, you don't necessarily have to throw that white or that yellow orange I was talking about. Pink is okay here. I throw that the biggest thing in my bobber you can possibly find because you are throwing a lot of weight and trying to get down deep. You're going to have to play with that weight a little bit and the depth to kind of get it right in these deep holes, but you're going to target large holes with slow moving water. The kokanee are going to stage up in that water. I have seen them sit in some fast riffles here and there, uh, and they, they definitely do. But most of the time, those larger pods that you're going to try and target are going to be in slow, deep moving water, especially around here in the Gunnison area. So you're going to want a large indicator rig that can get down deep. It's going to be tough to cast. Um, but I'd, I'd probably stick with maybe a six weight. You can definitely do it on a five weight, but it is hard. So look towards that six weight area and throw in heavy, heavy tippet because they will break you off. Some of the best flies for me that I use, um, with clients or myself are usually Pat's rubber legs, you know, black is fine. You know, number six Pat's rubber legs, big hook, large, sturdy hook, and it's buggy looking worm, obviously. Um, and also an egg. I like the green egg or kind of a neon green egg. For some reason, that's worked well for me. Doesn't mean they won't eat an orange or a pink or something like that, but this is what works for me. Uh, and you got to think about, too, these fish aren't necessarily hungry. Um, they're more aggressive than anything. So anything bright, buggy, usually does the trick and that's why like I said that Pat's rubber legs worm any type of worm uh, with a lot of movement a lot of color flash they will hit those they like those they're very aggressive when it comes to that if if you do find um, a pod that's large enough to fish to you know maybe 30 40 50 fish I have seen bigger pods up to that you know 100 fish or more um, you are going to end up foul hooking a lot of fish. It's just kind of the way it goes. That's why you got to play with that depth a little bit, play with that weight a little bit. And sometimes if, if you're in a boat or on top of these fish, you can see them and you can see your flies kind of dragging along bottom and you can get a little bit better idea. So you're not foul hooking as many fish, but it is the way it goes, you know, swinging that big, heavy nymph rig. Obviously we don't want to try to do that, but that's kind of what happens. Um, 
so getting those bugs on the bottom and trying to target those fish and get the best drift possible. I like to, especially with that big indicator rig, I almost like to pull those flies along just a little bit. I almost tight line it just a little bit in those big deep runs just so I can feel that indicator and feel any any type of motion or movement if it's hitting something I can I can watch that indicator or feel that indicator just stop and I'll set that hook and that's usually a pretty good method to go about it not necessarily looking for that perfect dead drift because it's going to be really hard to get a perfect dead drift especially in those big deep pools or circulating eddies or something like that where these salmon like to sit so almost pull those bugs along kind of through those pods of salmon and that that tends to help me as well um and then you know also don't be surprised if you're hooking into trout you know, those stubborn trout aren't going to leave those big, deep runs, those big, deep holes. So they'll kind of sit in there and hang out and still feed. And so don't be surprised if you're hooking in some trout. Could be good action, you know, fishing for those trout in there. Um, you're probably hooking them too, and you've never hooked them in that hole because you've never really fished that deep. You know, you might have fished this hole 30 times, 40 times and go, man, I just, I've never hooked fish in there really. It looks really fishy, but it's probably just because you haven't been fishing it that deep and now we are now we're trying to get down with two three split shot and large indicator where we can actually see those takes um, and then you can also use those salmon to target those large trout um, they, they might sit in between or even behind those kokanee salmon and feed off eggs or even flesh depending on how hungry they are you know i have tossed some flesh flies out there and caught some pretty big trout hanging on the ass end of those kokanee. So think about that too. You know, if you're walk waiting or, you know, you find a pot of salmon, take your time a little bit and look for those trout sitting in between or back, back behind them. Cause that happens more often than not that you might see a, a good 24 inch fish sitting behind those salmon. Um, and that can, that can be a lot of fun as well. So use those salmon to your advantage, even though they do push trout out of certain holes occasionally, um, they, it, they can, play to your advantage for sure so I, I mentioned tackle just a little bit you know what we're going to be using five weight you can definitely do it I like I said I've strictly gone to that six weight just a little bit more backbone in it and when you set that hook you know it is a hard set and you do have a lot of weight on there um, and once you hook one of these fish it is a pretty good fight they're going to take off running most of them are pretty hot um, they're ready to spawn like I said they've been moving up river quite a ways so they're ready to rock and roll. So get ready for that. Have that bigger tackle on there, have that bigger rod. Um, I usually fish two, three X, even one X occasionally. Um, but that two, three X doesn't necessarily have to be fluorocarbon. It can be. Um, but if you want to go a little bit cheaper, that nylon's fine. Two, three X will work. And I usually do two flies. Um, like I said, a pass rubber leg or a worm as your top fly works pretty well. I like that wire worm a lot. It's got a big hook on it. So if you do hook those salmon, they don't usually pop out. And then I'll go to an egg. Um, I'll even go pats to a worm or, you know, worm to an egg, pats to an egg. I'll switch it around just a little bit. And they, you know, I have noticed that they do key in on certain bugs other than others. That pats is a very good bet um, and the worm and the egg. So just play around with that just a tad. And like I said, be ready. You know, once you hook one of these guys, they are going to take off and, even if they foul, are foul hooked or hooked in the mouth or foul hooked, it's going to be a hard fight. So get ready to uh, put on your running shoes, maybe run down river if you're waiting in a boat. You know, it's a little bit different. You can kind of chase those fish. Usually I like to just hang out, let them fight a little bit, try not to let them get too far away from that boat. And then we'll get them into that slower water and be able to put a net on them. But they are a lot of fun to catch. And like I said, Colorado is one of those states where we are very fortunate enough to be able to fish for these, especially with clients where a lot of clients haven't seen something like this before. And so it's fun for them to be able to catch some trout and some salmon here and there. So um, it's it, it can be a very good time. So I mentioned earlier, you know, when we are nymphing for those trout, we are focusing a little bit more on those mid-river drifts. The kokanee tend to move the trout out of their natural areas just a little bit. And so Focusing on those mid-river drifts tends to help. Like I said, out of a boat, we see a lot of fish that come out straight from under the boat because they have, they got a little bit, mis, I wouldn't say misplaced, but they're not quite sure what's going on. Um, it happens every year. They, they just move out of those natural holes that they want to be in. So definitely focusing on those mid-rivers. Um, but I'd say kind of covered 
a fair amount about nymphing and about nymphing for the kokanee. So we're going to move on to our next subject here that I wanted to cover just just briefly. Um, but kind of that hopper dropper versus the indicator. Um, maybe it's just me, but I, you know, I hate watching an indicator just float down the river watching a bobber. At times it's fun. Um, I can get into it. I, I do love nymphing. I can, I can nymph, um, pretty well, I'd say, but, uh, I, I've been sticking with, I've been going with the hopper dropper a little bit more with clients. It is a little bit easier to throw at times and you don't have to worry quite about getting on the bottom as much. Um, I'd also say it's a little bit less intrusive than throwing an indicator with some weight and two flies on there where it's going to make a big splash. It's going to make a lot of noise when it comes down. And you do have that opportunity for a hopper tick, which is nice. Um, For me, letting clients know that, that kind of gets them excited as well, that there is a chance something might come up and eat that hopper. And depending on the day, depending on weather, you know, everything like that, they might be looking up and eating those hoppers. So it's always nice to have one of those on. We are still still nymphing, um, you know. It, it, I, buddy of mine and a fellow guide said the other day, he goes, "You're you're still nymphing unless you're getting maybe two or three eats a day. You're still nymphing." It's like, yeah, I am, um, but I do like the fact in the back of my head that I have that hopper on there, and I think clients like it as well. So there are some opportunities for those fish to come up and eat the hopper. Um, and like I said, it just depends on the day a little bit. It might depend on cloud cover, something like that. So you can kind of pick your battles. And obviously in a boat, um, it's a little bit tougher when you're walk waiting, but obviously in a boat we have, you know, five different rods rigged up with different things. And we have maybe indicator rigs, dry fly rigs, hopper rigs, all kinds of stuff so that we can tackle those situations when we get into them and make sure that we have the right stuff there. Um, if it's, deep water definitely you know if you're fishing just deep water the whole way maybe stick with that nymph rig and just fishing that indicator um if you do have those shallow shelves or drop offs if or if you see that those fish are hanging a little bit more on those banks i would i would stick to that hopper dropper with four or five x throwing throwing fluoro again and then i like to throw a little bit of weight for my first bug um and you can always throw a little split shot on there. Again, it's a fine line between nymphing and throwing an hopper, a hopper dropper, but um, you can always throw a split shot on there if you need to get a little bit deeper. So keep that in mind, that hopper dropper aspect of it. I like it too because because we're not fishing as deep, um, we have some more opportunities to maybe fish emergers. And fish emergers in those columns where those fish are coming up and eating dries or eating those emergers, eating those BWOs or what's midges or trichos, what's ever coming off that day. Um, so again, we aren't as deep. We kind of have that opportunity to be able to throw those emergers a little bit higher up in the column instead of getting down right on the bottom immediately and trying to catch those fish. And it could be day to day what's working better. You know, maybe that nymph rig on the bottom is working a lot better than that hopper dropper. So like I said, just pick your battles, experiment a little bit. That's what we're all doing out here. You know, as fly fishing guides, as fishermen, we're all experimenting a little bit every day. You can always learn more and always push the limits just a tad and try something new because it's not going to hurt. I mean, it's just fishing. Um, You know, it might hurt me a little bit with my job, you know, if I go out there and try and experiment with clients. So I do most of my experimenting on my own, and then I can take that to uh, opportunity with the clients. So definitely think about that hopper dropper. And I did mention, you know, those emergers. So we're going to jump into a little bit of that dry fly fishing, fall dry fly fishing, which can be excellent. Um, here in the Gunnison Valley, we just had a bunch of trichos, um, kind of move through our mid hatch pretty much, um, which was awesome. You know, about 11 o'clock, we had a bunch of trichos coming off and the zebra midge was killing it. If we had someone on the boat who could throw dries, you could throw a small trico dry, and that was crushing it. Those fish were enjoying the hell out of those. A lot of guys love the trico hatch and wait for the trico hatch every year. I don't get it. It's fun. You can catch a lot of big fish, like I said, on small bugs, and that's the tough part. But let's talk a little bit more about those bigger dries, um, what we're going to be seeing. Obviously, we're going to see caddis, depending on – water temp um you know those caddis i think that good water temp for them is 
maybe about 55, 56 degrees or so. And then we will be seeing some good betis action and BWO action. You know, once that water temp is about 46 to 56 degrees or so, we see those BWOs and the dry action can be very good this time of year, all the way through September. And again, those BWOs, everyone kind of thinks about those BWOs with cloud cover, rain. Um, that's definitely a factor. Uh, I've noticed with a little bit more cloud cover, the dry action is better on the Gunnison. And then it does go day to day. You know, I might have one good day where the dries are, are working, they're coming up, they're feeding, and then the next day it's a little tough. And so we move to that hopper dropper, that nymph rig, and go that route. But I like to start out throwing some dries. Obviously, everyone likes to see dries, especially clients. If fish are coming up and eating dries, that's a lot of fun. Not everybody can throw them, um, but this is a good opportunity, like I said, to see see some good dry fly action. So keep that in the back of your head. Um, out of a boat, it's definitely a little bit easier. If you are seeing rising fish when you're walk wading, I would, if it were me, I would take the time to maybe figure out what they're eating a little bit and throw those dries because you can have some good opportunities, especially those, like I said, those fish are getting hungry. They're on the feed. They are bright this time of year. You know, they've seen a lot of bugs go over them, but the opportunities are there to catch some nice fish. Um, I've been throwing dries out of the boat, like I said, maybe not seeing prolific catches. I'm not seeing those bugs coming off. I'm not seeing a ton of caddis or a ton of BWOs, but I am, I am throwing them because sometimes, you know, you got to, think outside the box a little bit and not everybody's throwing dries every day. A lot of people are sticking with those indicators or the hopper dropper rigs. And so that dry fly might be something different that they've never seen and they'll come up and look and you can still tease them up even though there's not fish rising constantly um, or you're not seeing a ton of bugs come off. You will still see some fish come up and eat, which is a lot of fun for me as a guide. And like I said, it's a lot of fun for clients to see that. So I have a good arsenal um, of caddis, foam caddis, all kinds of caddis in different colors and sizes, and then a good arsenal of betis. Um, even emergers, got to have a lot of emergers in that box this time of year. I have noticed on certain certain days, you know, a lot of people might be crushing it on that midge or something, you know, that's always in the water. Those midges are kind of always around year round. And then all of a sudden you throw on a bars emerger or a shot glass or something like that and boom 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 you start picking fish up mid-river or even on the banks you're going sweet all right those bwos are here they might not be hatching just yet because that water temperature isn't quite there um so keep that in mind just that there is going to be opportunities for those dries and always have a thermometer on you not not just because of watching that water temp if it's hot um but watching that water temp for hatches um there's some good guides out there as well that, um, excuse me, like guide books that'll have those hatches in there and what water temps you need for those hatches. Like I said, I believe that BWO is about 46 to 56 degrees, kind of depending. And then Caddis 56 or so um, is what I've been seeing. That's just me, again, my opinion. So um, definitely don't forget about the dries. We're going to move along from dry fly fishing just a little bit here. Um, and we're going to talk about what everybody loves to talk about in the fall. And that's throwing streamers. Everybody loves throwing streamers in the fall. It can be fun. It can be a lot of fun. Those fish are getting aggressive. Those big browns are getting aggressive. They're getting hungry, um, cause they're about to, about to start spawning here. So fall, everyone thinks about throwing streamers. Um, most people you talk to, Oh, fall fishing. Yeah. Throwing streamers is awesome. It's a lot of fun. It is. Um, again, it's one of those things where you got to pick your battles. You got to be able to be able to change it up whenever you need to, and you got to be ready to do that. So don't get stuck in your ways and, you know, go, oh, I'm just strictly a nymph fisherman. I'm strictly a dry fly fisherman, or I'm strictly a streamer fisherman in the fall. Be able to change it up, be able to be ready to go and maybe have that extra rod with you. If you're walk waiting in a boat as well, have a bunch of different things rigged up, ready to rock. So streamers, um, like I said, it can be good if you're looking for that big nasty brown that's going to come out of that hole and be aggressive. And it can be good all year round too. Um, winter's definitely a little bit tougher, but like I said, everybody thinks about fall fishing. They think about that streamer fishing. So I, I usually tend to only throw streamers when there's a bit of cloud cover. Um, 
I do feel the fish are a little bit more confident when there's some cod cover coming out of their safe spot and being able to attack a streamer or bait fish pattern or something like that, um, where they, they'll be a little bit more aggressive. And I was actually just reading a cool article today. Um, went to the chiropractor to get my back worked on. Um, but I was, while I was sitting there waiting, I was reading a cool article in Colorado outdoors and they were actually talking about the ice side of fish and brown trout. I believe it was, they have more rods, I think like something like that than rainbow trout. So they can actually see a little bit better, um, when it's darker water and cloud cover. So that could be too, a big thing to think about. And again, I, I didn't get to finish the entire article to go through, but um, it was an interesting article. I believe it was the July, August um, edition of Colorado Outdoors. And they were talking about the ice side of fish or ice side of trout for the most part. And it was very interesting to see. And that made a lot of sense in my head when I go, oh, cloud cover, you know, I'm going to throw streamers. Perfect. Boom. Those fish, those brown trout can see those streamers a lot better when there is cloud cover. There's not as much sun. And that could be why you're catching a lot more browns during that time. Um, so I like to throw streamers when there's a bit of cloud cover. That's some of my favorite time, or even when it's raining too. Uh, if you can't throw that hopper dropper, those dry flies as well with a downpour, those streamers can help. Um, if I'm throwing them, usually I'm out of a boat. I don't tend to throw too many streamers when I'm walk waiting. It is, I used to a lot, um, and I'll go into that here in a minute, but, uh, I, I like to throw them out of the boat a little bit more. You can just cover more ground. You can hit those pockets instead of fishing one area and just swinging a streamer through there or ripping a streamer through every every time. Um, and you'll kind of know right off the bat, I, I think, in my opinion, if they are eating streamers, um, you're going to know if they're going to eat them or not kind of by those first couple of casts and good pockets, especially in a boat. I, I hate sitting there and watching people throw streamers or even buddies on the boat when they're not eating, it's pretty tough. Um, it's tough to watch when, you know, they're just casting and casting and just wearing their arm out. But if you're one of those guys, you know, that likes to beat his dick against the wall and just no, don't take no for an answer, by all means, keep throwing a streamer and seeing what happens. Uh, I urge you to change up colors, change up size, change up patterns, see if they're keen on one thing. Same with nymphing, you know, just keep changing until you find something that works. But like I said, I can't stand to sit there on the boat and row a boat and just watch somebody huck a streamer and not see a fish. I've done it too many times for miles and miles on end where you're going, why are we doing this? The definition of insanity is right here. This is what we're doing. Doing the same thing over and over again, expecting a different result. It's not going to happen. So if you are in a boat and throwing some streamers, you know, if, if you're looking for that big fish to come out, definitely go for it. Keep chucking them. If you're trophy hunting, keep chucking them. Um, but in my opinion, you're not, it's not going to be a whole lot of fun for the person rowing that boat or for you, if you're just casting and not seeing much. And my, my kind of theory on it, you know, like I said, I used to fish a lot of streamers walk wind and I don't so much anymore. And I don't really put clients on them, especially on a, I mean, I do on a boat occasionally, but um, that's in kind of dire need, or if it is, is cloudy and rainy and it's tough, then I might throw a streamer on there. Um, but I used to throw them a lot when I was walk waiting and the way I think about it now, when I look back, I wasn't too experienced in anything else. And so a lot of people getting into fly fishing, obviously they want to throw dries or they find streamers. They go, Oh man, streamers are the best, you know? And I have a good buddy of mine who chucks a lot of streamers and I ran into him this summer and he's like, oh, dude, the streamer bite has just been unreal, man. Like, it's been amazing. I go, you should try dry flies because the dry fly action has been insane. And in my opinion, that's a lot more fun. Um, being able to see a fish come up and eat a fly off the top of the water and be able to judge that fly, whether it's something they want to eat or not, is a lot cooler to me than seeing that aggressive strike. Obviously, if I could catch a 30-inch brown on a streamer, that'd be pretty fun. But that doesn't happen every day. So in my opinion, that for me, when I was doing that, when I was fishing a lot of streamers, um, I, I didn't really know anything different. I didn't know anything better. So that's why I threw a lot of streamers. I wasn't very good at nymphing. Um, I didn't know hatches very well. I didn't know bugs very well. I, 
wasn't a great tire, so I didn't tie a lot of bugs. I tied a lot of streamers, and I kept playing around, and I found some that worked and found my patterns that were good. But I I definitely want to push you to kind of get out of your comfort zone and not necessarily throw streamers all the time. Um, like I said, fall can be a great time for it. But And there's a lot of guys who are going to criticize me for that. I'm like, oh, screw you, man. Like Streamers are the best. That's how you catch the big ones. You'll talk to a lot of people, too, who are going to say the opposite. You know, yeah, you see a lot of big fish come off streamers, but a lot of those fish are sipping dries or eating midges on the bottom. So think about that. There's a couple good rules that go along with that. But, um, you know, I guarantee those fish are eating small bugs in the morning or sipping dries, like I said, and you think back, I mean, everyone's going to go, oh, look at Kelly Gallup, look at Kelly Gallup, look at him. He throws streamers all the time. He doesn't. He doesn't. Um, Kelly Gallup is a nymph fisherman. He loves to nymph, and he's good at it. Um, the streamer fishing was a different game, and he brought brought in those streamers and um, upgraded the game a little bit. So, like I said, I want to urge you to get, get out of that comfort zone of just throwing streamers for the most part and move into something else, try something a little bit different because there's a whole nother world out there once you get away from those streamers. So that's kind of my backstory on it. Um, like I said, you can you can do what you want. I don't care. Do whatever you want. Um, but if you're on my boat, if we're guiding, if we're fishing together, we're going to be fishing what's working. Um, obviously, if we're having fun and just goofing off, yeah, throw a streamer, go for it. I don't care. Um, and if it's on, yeah, let's keep throwing them. But for the most part, I can't sit there and watch somebody just beat their head against the wall, like I said earlier. But I said, I said beat your dick against the wall doing something that's not working. So I'd like to throw something that works. Um, but streamers are a good bet for sure during the fall. Um, but just don't discount everything is what I'm saying. Don't discount everything else. <laughs> Um, like I said, yeah, doesn't mean streamers can't produce. Um, if I am throwing some streamers, one of my favorite patterns is going to be a sparkle minnow. I like it in white and I also like it kind of in that autumn color, you know, root beer, yellow, orange color with some flash on it. I love that sparkle minnow. That's a, a great bug to use and it has good action. Yes, it only has that one hook. Um, you can always throw a little trailer hook off the back if you are tying them or something, but I, that's one of my favorites so far is that, co I believe it's coffee sparkle minnow, but look into that. And then when you are fishing them, you know, whether walk waiting or out of a boat, definitely kind of targeting in those same areas, targeting pockets, targeting, you know, right up against those bank and those deep drop offs, those ledges, shelves, um, where that big Brown might be lurking, ready to eat one of those for sure. I've covered quite a bit about how I like to fish during the fall a little bit um, and the way I like to do it. Obviously, it's not always going to be the right way, but it's the way I like to do it in the fall. And hopefully I didn't go over things too quick and I didn't bore you too much. I try and keep it interesting. Um, and I know it's tough with one guy sitting here telling you how to fish and, you know, what techniques he should be using, what size tip it flies, blah, blah, blah. But hopefully these techniques um, that I use have helped you just a little bit and maybe up your game just a tad. And kind of, like I said, from that guide perspective and what I like to fish and how I like to fish it. So, um, fall fishing, it can be, uh, it can be one of my favorite times of the year to fish. You know, September is an awesome month. Um, don't leave anything out of the question though. Like I said, nymphing, hopper dropper, dry streamers, they're all good. You got to pick your battles, but you know, the nice thing about fall and coming into September here, it's nice and cool. You know, it's not going to be too hot in the middle of the day we got good little breeze helping us out just a tad you know leaves are starting to change the scenery is beautiful so um, definitely have that in the back of your head too but most of all fish are hungry there's plenty of opportunity to get some good fishing in before it gets too cold especially around here in Colorado um, and where I'm at in Gunnison it gets very cold um, like I said hopefully these some of these techniques will help you out and be successful during these upcoming months and be able to target some good fish. Um, again, I appreciate everybody for listening. You know, I know I haven't been on top of it, top of my game as much as I should have lately. Um, hopefully 
you guys keep following. I'm going to keep trying to produce as much as I can when I can and put out some good podcasts for you guys. Um, definitely been busy, which has been good. Um, going through a lot of life stuff as well, so it's been tough trying to get on the mic here and sit down and have, have a moment to be able to do this, so it's been good. Good for me as well to sit down and have this conversation. I know I'm sitting here talking to myself, but um, you guys are listening, hopefully. Um, so again, I appreciate it. Thanks for everybody um, coming out and turn on your computers, your phones, whatever, and listening to the Guided Trip podcast. You can email me, theguidedtrip at gmail.com. You can also find us on Instagram. Uh, my Instagram is cameron.roads and then the podcast Instagram is the guided trip. Um, all one word. So you can contact us there as well. Definitely give us a follow. The link to all the podcasts um, is in the bio. And um, yeah, thanks guys. Uh, tight lines to you. Hope, hopefully some happy fishing and uh, drink a couple beers for me while you're out there and um, enjoy it. Almost forgot, I want to throw a big shout out to Sam Pankratz and Jenny, who just recently got married. They do the intro and outro music for us, so congrats to those guys. Enjoy. Thank you.